currently pushing start streaming. All right, this should be fun. I hope. I actually think that what I should probably do is have the stream on one and the slide on the other, and then see how well that works. Uh, let's see. I'll actually run some informal office hours in Discord today, for five. And not, not, not formal. I'll just be hanging out there. I'll even put myself on video if you want. And I'll continue to post the slides and the links to the videos. I'll put them up on YouTube. Um, somebody explained what I kind of suspected, which is there's some magic setting somewhere in Twitch that recordings there, and then. Then they added the additional benefit, of, thank you very much, of, oh, and if you actually wanted to never go away, do this thing. Oh, gee, this is wonderful. For Amazon. Uh, the guy that I started working with here at UBC, the one I actually wanted, the reason I wanted to come here and work uh, here was because of Andy Warfield. And of course, I started working with him in January of 2017, and he left in October of 2017. Go to work for Amazon on this product you you probably have never heard of called um, S3. S3. It is one of the oldest AWS products. It is actually a, a an object store, and it is a huge, scalable, really funky model object. It is a quintessential classic. Storage. Amazon has lots and lots of storage. They buy drives by boatload. Not figuratively, literally. Here, here's another container ship full of full of drives from Thailand or uh, where else are they making them? Okay. Nom, I think. Have to pay a lot of money to get the some public never been a bigger manufacturer drive. Thailand. And uh, oh do you know where the largest Intel facility in the world is? I'm talking about you specifically. Hey, good morning. I've been there. No guesses. It's not in the United States, and it hasn't been in the United States for decades. It's actually Malaysia. Intel opened their first overseas facility in um, Penang, outside Penang, in the 1960s or 70s or something, and it's huge now, absolutely gargantuan. It's got a class there. They have like people who build BIOSes for computers and networking, <clears throat> networking device for that sort of it was like a 45 minute ride in the car. I wasn't driving, so I was driving there. Uh, we went through all these fields and whatnot. Huge. Intel facilities are always like gargantuan. Wow, this makes YVR look tiny. Um, so I'm going to continue posting things on my website just because it, trying to post it in multiple places is confusing, and I'd actually like not to lose canvas a little bit. Not that I know why anybody. So I'll put them on YouTube. They, the first one is on YouTube. I know YouTube. Monetize them appropriately. And and share none of that with me. Uh, again, I said this Tuesday. I'll probably say this several times. Slides are more reminders of me of what I wanted to talk about and less tended to be a textbook for you. Lots of people are like, oh, I need the slides. And like, I don't think the slides by themselves are going to tell you all that much. And that's not new for me. That's something I've always done. I, the flip side of that is the lectures are never the same twice. I've actually had people take uh, one of my classes multiple times, and they're like, each time they took it, they learned a lot from it. Like, you know, when you first get started in a field, you don't know anything about it, you sit down, you go through the material, and you get this, you walk away with a big picture. And then you start working in the for a couple of years, and you come back and take the same class, and now you're like filling in the gaps in the big picture. Oh, I got that wrong, and you're fixing things. And you come in a couple of years later, and you do it again, and now it's like detail that I mentioned in passing that I talk about, and it's like, oh wow, 
never realized that. And it's not like one person is doing it. I actually have multiple people intensive five-day class in building files. Uh, so today's failure, remember I said I was going to start every lecture with a failure. Today's failure is October 4th, 2021. I almost replaced this with yesterday's failure, literally. Um, I don't know if anybody noticed, but in the United States, there was a tiny, tiny little problem in the United States with uh, the federal Aviation Administration computer system. They've already done the failure analysis. They already know what went wrong. And so I'll probably use that next week. Partially because it really hammers home a very important point, and that is automate things. Humans screw up all the time. But this was the Facebook outage. You might actually remember this. It broke WhatsApp, it broke Facebook, it probably broke Instagram as well. Um, and then, of course, the world was better place for what caused it this configuration just happened to be a really really bad mistake it took data center off of the internet so their remote engineers could not remote in because they couldn't actually access the data center the data center Affected is in Menlo Park, California, which I used to live in because I worked at Stanford, which is uh, one city to the south. And it's not a data center that normally people walk into because these big data centers aren't actually built for humans to walk in. They're loud, they're optimized for lots and lots of computers, their primary concern. What is the primary concern of a big data center? I heard somebody say, yeah, heat dissipation. How the hell do you get rid of all that heat? It's why we do crazy things in data centers. Like um, Microsoft Research had a whole project where they only, they, they, they powered off hard drives. They figured out how much energy they could save, not because of the hard drives, but because it dissipates from the hard drives. They found that they could keep about 8% of the drives active at any time. And that was a huge savings. In, in and you know what the problem with using air conditioners? Yeah, it turns out they actually pull moisture out of the air and you gotta do something with that. And moisture in computers do not mix. Um, during the computer science department, you might know that there was a small flood on the sixth floor of the X-Wing. And my research group, had just put $3 million worth of brand new computer equipment, which took them three years to get in there. And guess what? Computers and water do not mix. So it will probably be another three years before they can replace them, at which point all of the technology that yeah, will be obsolete anyway, right? Oh well. So I'm not going to read the text there, but it's a really fascinating discussion about what actually happened and how it unrolled. And it's just, it's like, it just happens in an instant. And again, it's the same thing as the FAA, which is why I was like, ooh, this is a, a really good example. Manual configuration, doing anything manually, not having good checks, will screw you every single time. Now I can wing it during this class, pulling the thing together, everything breaks, and I am just like, okay, I'll fix it, I'll do this, a little stressful for a few minutes, and then I move on. When you take, Facebook off the internet. Somebody is going to. The reality is that if you create a culture, because this is biases, right? It's got to be somebody's fault. We've got to we've got to punish someone for this. If you build that kind of culture, what will happen is people will try to hide their mistakes, and that's actually worse. In aviation, general model sounds like general model is. Things go wrong, humans screw up, and we have to build systems that can account for that. But what did I say on Tuesday? What is this class about? Failure. How do I deal with failure? You will fail. Things will fail. People will fail. Everything will go wrong. You have to be able to recover. So let's talk about things that fail. Ha! Huh. 
right on the top of the list, networks. Um, my old boss, David Sheraton, I think last I saw he was the eighth richest Canadian in the world. Or in, yeah, eighth, eighth, eighth richest Canadian. Um, when I worked for him, he wasn't rich. A newly tenured professor at Stanford. And he had survived a grueling process where Stanford's brutal. Right? They hired seven uh, junior profs at the same time, and they kept them. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the others left before I got there. Went on to build the X Windows. You might have heard of X Windows, graphical doing system. It was based on the same flying OS called V, built the windowing system W4, and then Brian Reed went Equipment Corporation X. At any rate, uh, David's sitting out on his porch uh, 1990, long time, probably for any of the foreign, but, and a couple of grad students showed up on his porch and pitched an idea for a company that wanted to perform. And he decided it was such a good idea, he was going to invest $100,000 in it. Andy Becklesheim, who was his partner in other ventures, uh, picked in $100,000 as well. It turns out that investing $100,000 in a company that doesn't even exist, they hadn't incorporated, they hadn't formed it, didn't have a name, can be a really good investment. Okay, that company's name is Alphabet. Probably the best return on investment ever. When Google went public, there was a front page article on the Wall Street Journal. And they have these little dot drawings. And this has been one of their signature things. Is, and he had a little dot drawing of him on the front page because at the IPO, he had to sell an extra $48 million worth of shares. My heart bled for him. But he always called this the obsolete. And that was in the 80s. And most people didn't think it was obsolete. But this is a traditional picture you will see over and over again. And the TCP stack is basically one through four with some hand wavy things that on top of that. Reality is we don't actually very many of the OSI protocols, but the layering model lots and happen over and over. My joke always is the reason that we layer things is because we know that more layers is better and faster. It's like cake. You want a one layer cake or you want a three layer cake? A lot more frosting than three layer cake it tastes better. We don't layer things because it makes them faster. We layer things because it makes them easier to reason about. And we're going to see that picture over and over again, where we use or exploit layering in order to build abstractions that simplify our analysis of what happens across those abstractions. Probably spent three and a half years hearing all sorts of different examples of how we modularize things, layer them, and we isolate them, blah, 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 and on and on. It's mostly because we can't with infinite state space exploration. And one of the techniques we use for limiting that state space isolate, layer them, define a very small subset of behaviors that can happen across this boundary. Distributed systems. I mentioned this on Tuesday. I'll keep saying it pretty much every day. Distributed systems are all about communications between disparate actors. The problem is that this kind of, we tend to think of like, oh, here, I've got my computer here, right? That's not a distributed system. In fact, it has a CPU that talks to some memory through a bus. And you know what that bus is delivering? Messages. Even individual computers can actually look like they are 
distributed system. Uh, there's a big thing about disaggregation where they move all the memory in a rack to one place, they move all the storage in another place, and they put the GPUs down here, they put the CPUs over here, and then they put networks between them. And the networks are now really, really fast. And I look at those and I go, this looks like it's a big old stack mainframe. That's kind of what they did. They used a communications mechanism, a bus, deliver messages from one component to another component quickly. But there's got to be something else that distinguishes here. And I mentioned that on Tuesday, and I'm going to mention it again today, and that is fate sharing. If we all have the same power supply, when power goes out, we're done. We all exist or don't exist together. And to some extent, distributed systems is an attempt for us to try and mimic that sort of fate sharing. But we're going to do it in a more constrained interface, a more constrained sort of way. It will make it easier for us to reason about what's actually happening underneath. Let's talk about all sorts of things that I'm sure that some of you might even remember if you took computer networks, and I know that was a prerequisite. It's not like I went and looked to see what they actually teach in the computer networks course. Networks are not distributed systems. They are a component that is necessary for creating a distributed system, any kind of input. But somebody asked on today, in class or after class, is there it is a client server system a distributed system? So raise your hand if you think that a client server system is a distributed system. Either commit or don't commit. Don't go halfway and say, well, you know, I'm gonna hit. Right, yeah. You know, I don't care if you're right or wrong. And how many of you think it's not? And how many of you are just sitting there going, I'm gonna raise my hand, it's too much effort this early in the morning. For quite a few in the class. Uh, it is a distributed system, right? Because the client can fail, but the server is running. The server can fail and the client can do it. That, that ties it more to the fate sharing concept that we're going to see over and over again. One can fail, the other one running. Actual real system. One of the problems I had that made me upgrade my video card, I really needed 90. Um, was that I had a, a 6900 XT AMD card, and it periodically, like, you know, time of the day, one day, and the next day it would be fine, and the day after that it would lock up once, and tired of that. Um, the rest of the machine was running. And that immediately told me I knew what the problem was, or I suspected what the problem was. I don't want to have a bias here, uh, but that bias helps me also debug things. Ha, ah, I bet it's this. But then I'm disciplined enough to actually go and try and collect the data. Um, in multi-processor systems, it's actually possible to have a uh, live lock situation where some of the processors are waiting for other processors to drop a lock and, and they're not making progress. But some of the other processors who are not involved in any of that stuff are making more progress. And literally, that was the graphics would just, it would immediately. But you know, Discord would continue working. Okay, so the computer's not really dead. That's why I say sometimes fate sharing even on the same system guarantee. And work can sort of work. They have partial failure. Partial failure is really hard to reason about. Oh, and guess what? Uh, the placement of the 900 to 4090 problem. Now I have different problems, but fix that particular problem. Now it doesn't really work very well with HDR. One driver to work right? I've worked with both of these graphics. It's been a number of years, but I know graphics drivers are some of the most complicated pieces of code ever written. They are like their own little operating system. They are like millions of lines of C plus code. I'm amazed that they can get any of it to work right at all. And I actually tried to get the piece of hardware I needed to be able to capture a crash dump so I could have actually debugged the 6900 tank. With a crash dump, I could have easily done that. I think I mentioned this. He makes it in Canada, but they won't even share my call or my email. And you can't order it on the website. You have to get a quotation. Just put it on Amazon. Except no one would buy it. Because it's actually the super, super simple piece of hardware that creates a non-maskable 
from us then is captured by Windows, which then says, oh, if this, if you configured the operating system correctly, I'll make a crash dump for you. And the reason I know a lot about this is because I worked with a company bug in Microsoft Simple on Mac interrupt handling. Remember I was talking about messages and sending it back and forth? Well, non masterful interrupts are actually broadcast. They're not unicast. Every other interrupt is a unicast. It gets corrected to one core. A non masterful interrupt is sent to all of them. And guess what they all do? They all jump to a spin lock. One of them wins it and then sends a non, a, 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 an interprocessor interrupt to the other ones that says, oh, save your state in the crash dump in, in memory so I can make a crash dump. But of course, that interrupt is blocked. Non masterful interrupt is the highest priority interrupt, and you can't do anything lower priority. Oops. So you get the crash dump, but it didn't have the data that you needed to debug it. And so uh, these folks who were down in uh, California, they uh, actually fixed it. They built all the units. But they were running Windows. All right. So a lot of what we get concerned about here is we, all this underlying network stuff we mostly don't spend a lot of time looking at. And this is one of those biases that's very interesting because bias is you have two basic choices. Use reliable delivery or use unreliable delivery. Which one do you use? Pick one. Now. Unreliable? Why? And if it doesn't show up, it's like ordering from AliExpress. Holy shit, is it going to show up or not? Best effort, my ass. You didn't even put it in the mail. <laughs> Just Apparently, some people actually have ordered from AliExpress. It's kind of a crap shoot. Away. <laughs> but it's so cool. Order three of them. See, that's retransmission. It's amazing how uh, the real world technology is. Uh, so lots and lots of networking here. We're going to be talking about session layer stuff because that's a lot of what we're going to be concerned about. And many of the distributed system services are exporting interfaces that I would argue are at application level. So all of the REST APIs that you look at are basically application level APIs. But down underneath the covers, what we're doing is we're implementing session and presentation layer issues. And then we're building an application level library, which is really cool. And that's where a lot of people work these days. Uh, many of these things live on long periods of time. They provide guarantees, yada, 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 blah, blah. All right, so what do we do to make this thing tractable? i already been mentioning it. We modularize, we layer, we isolate. We create little components. We put standardized interfaces in there so that we can plug things together. Uh, anybody ever traveled to another country besides Canada? Ever tried to plug your laptop in? You know, amazingly enough now, you can pretty much just do it and it just works. One of the challenges when I first started traveling was that, in fact, you had to actually plug your computer into a telephone line to dial up somewhere in order to contact your home office or anything. You know that every country in the world pretty much has their own plug phone? I used to carry bags of different adapters for the telephone, including alligator clips. Because even though every country has a different shaped plug, they all use they all use a wire system the same world around. You don't have to do that anymore because number one, you don't have to plug into the dial up. And number two, um, the RJ45, the RJ, whatever the RJ connector is, one that's not an RJ45, RJ11, uh, has planted it. The world has become a standardized, uniform place for things like telephone and network connections. So we don't have any problems with that. That's a really good example of why we use standardized interfaces. I can literally plug in to an RJ45, and assuming it was wired correctly, works. How do you plug an Ethernet port? I do that a game, and I don't want 
my fly lag. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's the same way, right? Yeah. Um, I at home, I plug in. I can get 800 and some odd megabit per second off of my LS fiber. Uh, do it through Wi-Fi, and it's under 100. So it's a huge difference. Of course, I live in a big building. It's so bad, the interference is so bad, I actually have a mesh in my small apartment. Because internet has to work. Oh. Um, so it simplifies things. It makes it easier for us to have compatibility. It, it, if I literally want to replace that RJ45 with something else, let's say I want to put some fiber behind it, you don't care. You don't know. It doesn't matter. As long as it's got the right connector, you just plug it in. Your laptop, you plug it in. Oh, I've got this funny thing that actually takes the plugs and converts them to whatever it is the plug on my machine is, or I get a different cord on that too. Because uh, they use standard EIA power cords, and all the power supplies these days are auto switching. They detect it. Doesn't matter if you're in East Japan or Western Japan, which use different frequencies. You knew that, right? Or you go to Europe, and you know some people use they use different shaped plugs. Not too bad. Europe's pretty. Um, but it's it's a different voltage than you get in North America. And you go to the UK, and they have those massive plugs. Every single one of them, because the the British are terrified of electric. Or I've actually stayed at bed and breakfast there where they turn the genius hot water system off. Not because it takes any energy, not pulling any water through it, just because they're afraid of the electricity. And they don't bother to tell you this so you get a cold shower. Then they tell you afterwards. Okay. It's not quite as bad as saying it. It had Airbnb. Speaking of distributed systems. Uh, so the implementation isn't necessarily the same as the interface. That's kind of the whole thing here. It frees us up to implement different, try experiments, add functionality. We can streamline things. Replace our unreliable delivery service with a reliable delivery service. We can defer what implementation we actually use. Still, it's just in time. And we do this a lot. No, that if you don't work and you never needed it, it saves more time than if you work and then you don't. Referring things is often a very effective strategy. It's kind of like studying for the final exam, right? Uh, there, there was a study one. Not that, Studied for the final after they actually had higher scores. Yeah, that was one of those. Feel like. Um, and then there's this constant tension between sharing things versus isolation. I see this a lot. I deal with storage. I plot one of the most expensive things. Data around. It'll kill you. And I remember seeing this, I mean, I wasn't much older than you are now, because I was working at Stanford, and we got some new workstations, and these were way faster. And I noticed that time to perform a task went down. I, I was measuring some, something that was copy and paste. Time to perform the copy went down, but the percentage of the time that was by the CPU copied the data went up. That's because it got faster, whereas memory didn't as much faster as it is. And this is not something that's new, it's been going on for decades. Get faster memory slowly, much more slowly, faster speed. The number of tricks that we play in computer systems in order to make really slow DRAM, which really slow DRAM means it takes 90 nanoseconds, work effectively, mind boggling. Of on processor memory, fastest. 
So it's 100 nanoseconds. Let's say it's 100 nanoseconds. Nanoseconds. How long does it take to get to the register process? That's the fastest number. It's actually less than 500 picoseconds. And all processors have a cache. cache. Um, we don't have to build things this way. This is the way we build them for learning as well. Uh, that's the same exact memory. So it's all basically half a nanosecond. Yeah. And it's like, wow. So there's 100 or 200 orders of magnitude difference in performance. And those, the, the, that memory on the processors is expensive. That's why we only put like a little tiny bit, 30 Of course, the first computer I programmed had 5K of So what we have to do in order to make these things work now is we have to have models. What are we trying to accomplish? You know, so we'll give you all sorts of vague hand wavy kinds of things, but you have to say, okay, this is like security. Somebody asked about security. First thing in security, you want to be taken seriously, you have to have a threat model. And in essence, we're gonna to have to do the same thing with distributed systems. What failures are we trying to handle? If Marvin the Martian wants to blow up the Earth, we're probably not going to be able to handle that. But if we put that in our threat model, we could design systems that put, well, data centers on Mars. Because he's on Mars, he's not going to blow up Mars. So therefore, now we have a failure model for that. So you need to have a model for what you're trying to accomplish. You need to understand what the constraints are. Well, you only get $7.35 for this project. And that will happen a lot. No matter who you work for, they're going to have a finite amount of resources. And most of the time, we think of those resources as how much money spent. And what are your assumptions? And you're going to have lots of assumptions. Some of them you will actually identify and properly list. And some of them will find out your assumptions, realize that you hadn't identified and get them wrong. Biases are actually useful. Is that as you gain more experience because more things fail and you learn how to deal with it, now you have a larger list of biases. I you know what what assumptions you should be making and should not be making. So biases both go both ways. They limit your search. Does anybody remember networks? A few people. Good. All right. So for the people who don't remember them, good luck. This is going to be a relatively fast review. I have a lot of slides to go through, but there's not very much. Uh, at the bottom of the network stack, I just use the same OSI picture over and over again. I just moved it around trying to be awake. I find that people learn more when they are awake. Than when they are awake. So when I first started working with networks, I was working with so fourth year undergrad student working for the computer science department. One of the things that I was doing was soldering uh, 15 pin shells, plugs that we were using to connect our, our new workstation internet. 10 megabit per second each. And then I went to Stanford, and Stanford actually had coaxial cable. This is big yellow cable, and every three meters there was a mark on the cable because the way you connected to it, you took this this vampire tap, it literally had a pin that it would push all the way through the core. Um, and you had to do that at three meter marks because they, they needed to know where the reflection points were to detect. Yeah, I know it's just really, wow. Yeah, pretty crazy stuff, right? So we can run signals over almost anything. Um, you can actually do really crazy things like Oppian Carrier. One of my favorite examples. It was originally written as an April Fool's joke, but in fact, there are now like four RFCs about using uh, um, messenger or IP. So you know, you strap the message on the on the leg of the pigeon, let the pigeon go, <laughs> and <laughs> great. It's pretty funny. They have a quality of service standard for it. Uh, and in some ways. Messenger pigeons aren't any better than electromagnetic signals that you Wi Fi. Uh, the new guy who actually got his PhD, I think it was patients 
the atmosphere, right? So like talking to satellites and whatnot. Doing this outcome of that. And that's really complicated because clouds have moisture in them that interferes with propagation of electromagnetic fields. And talk about error handling. We've got these crazy forward error correcting codes and all sorts of really interesting information theory stuff. So I mean, Harvey's book class. Uh, he, that's what he talks about is information theory. Information theory is great. Bob Shannon was um, a remarkable up with all of the stuff that he did about how we pack things. And today it's a very active field. We do encryption, compression, uh, error correction, all of these things. So what do we worry about at the physical layer? We worry, worry about latency. How long does it take to go through that? There's finite speed for an electromagnetic electrical signal. Copper. Uh, there is a how fast you can actually make light move fiber optic cable. Have other issues with attenuation. There are cheap fibers where you can only go a couple kilometers. There are expensive fibers where you can go up to about 100 kilometers. And what happens at 100 kilometers? Well, by that time, the signal is attenuated enough that you have to you have to read the signal, reamplify it, and retransmit it. And they literally do this under the ocean. It's pretty cool. Wow. Little uh, nuclear battery in there. Literally, there are ships that are continuously laying fiber optic cables, at the and they are painfully aware of these kinds of limits. That's the expense of fiber. Pretty cool these days, where you can actually get like all made. You make your own fiber kit, fiber optic cable. The way that you did that was you trimmed the edge and then you polished it under a microscope because the place that you mo lost most of the signal is in the connector. That's still true today. And it's true for RJ45s, over-engineered compensate. That. They twist the wires very carefully to try and minimize the crosstalk and all sorts of things that the physical layer have to worry about. It's really cool. Uh, you can get latency vari variations here. And that's, again, because you start putting retransmission in there, and there can be small delays that get introduced. And so it's not exactly the same amount of time to get from one end of the Earth to the other end of the Earth. There's a certain amount of variability there. Uh, so the highest latency I've ever seen was when I was doing work, IP multitask, and we were talking to a site in the UK via a satellite connection. And it was about two seconds round trip. Pretty awesome. That really pushes your your regular network latency. Don't game on it. Action. Don't even do it on a satellite. I've done that. It's very painful. 600 milliseconds. Uh, error rates. Been very much in the media and on all sorts of things that I've been talking about. Crosstalk. Uh, how good the person installing the connector was. For really important. Like in data centers, they actually certify them, test them, and make them properly. Don't do that. And guess what? You end up with failure. What kinds of errors can happen? Well, when we have shared media, we can get collisions. So, the vampire tap cables I was talking about were the three meter marks. But you needed to know how long they were because you had a maximum. You had to be able to collect that. Uh, when someone else had tried to transmit on the same piece of fiber within a certain amount of time. Well, think of that as time, but in fact, the way that we think about them in the higher levels is we think, how much data do I have to send before I know that I've got the channel? Right. That becomes the effective minimum size of any packet you can put on the ether. Today, we don't use vampire tap cables. Everything is point-to-point is -point wired our topologies and whatnot. And we still have a minimum size that we derived from the original vampire tap cables. Like, did you ever, there's a, you know, still system, no more than 72 characters. Because IBM had 80 column punch cards and the character, the number, so there were only 72 characters. And it's like these weird limits. So 80 and 72 are these magic numbers that you see 
still used in today. I mean, none of us in this room, including me, have used punch cards. I, I, I lied. I used them when I was elementary for an art project. Use punch cards. You know, when you painted them gold or something. Okay, I don't think that counts. Data errors happen. My favorite example, neutrinos. If you get some sort of unpredictable weirdness in a computer environment, go look and see what the solar storm activity was during that time frame because, believe it or not, it actually is credible, although it's completely It's actually credible. Neutrino storms will cause problems in RAM. This is why we use ECC RAM. Well, we should use ECC RAM. Uh, competing signals. I'm trying to use it. You're trying to use it. This is Wi-Fi in a multi-tenant building. Anybody live on? You have Wi-Fi conflict all the time, right? Wi-Fi is flaky. Not quite as bad as AliExpress, but imperfections in physical components. It turns out that anything real actually has imperfections in it, and those will cause light variations in all sorts of things. So now we move up a layer. So now we know how to send signals across back and forth, but somebody has to actually take those signals and turn them into something intelligible. And we're going to actually, uh, th that's our data link layer. At the data link layer, this is where we start to really see what we consider messages. There are framing protocols, even at the physical layer, but data link layer. Uh, what messages, what kinds of messages, how big is the message that I'm carrying with me, and a checksum, because I don't trust underlying. And I, I actually did bowling me around, because these are like things I've never even looked at. The original uh, data link layer protocol, the oldest one I could find, was RFC 27. That's been around a long time. This is kind of changed the detail. But even IP has been around since the 70s. Um, so Ethernet, data link layer. It, it defines what the messages are, has a minimum and a maximum size based on the characters of coaxial cable, the maximum based on somebody's idea of how much memory they wanted to put in physical hardware in order to receive a message. Because you can't receive half a message and do anything with it. If a whole message, then you can do something with it. Like if I take half the love letter and deliver it to you, I don't know what to do. Um, actually, but if you have a whole thing, then you can like look at it and go, I, oh, whatever. Uh, Avian carriers, I work for, for a company that built transfer mode equipment. Early 1990s. First company I worked in public. Actually, uh, very interesting. Hopefully, you'll get to one good way. Now we're going to lay it, move up again. Same thing all over again. Okay, so now we've got this thing which allows us to move messages across our physical connection in a way that we can process. But now, what happens when we want to? string multiples of these networks together. Now we need to have a network layer protocol. This is where most people actually start their analysis. Because this is where the IP protocol runs. IP is just one possible Ethernet protocol. If you actually go look at the Ethernet specifications, there are many protocols that, that can run on top of Ethernet. IP is just one. It just happens to be like 99.9999% of all of the traffic. It goes on exaggerating. There are other protocols. IPs. It's the biggie. It connects distinct networks together. It allows us to relay messages. So I get a message, and I can now put it onto another network. And that's because I have a connection to network A and network B. If I have a connection to network A and network B, and I relay messages from network A to network B and vice versa, I am a router. Because now I can have network A, B, and C, and I could decide. It's not very interesting for networks. It becomes interesting when there's one more. And I can decide where do I forward this message? That's what network protocols do. Uh, it also, interesting, 
not support one-to-many delivery. Broadcast, that's an easy one. Deliver this to everybody. It's kind of like junk mail. Or multicast, which don't deliver this to everybody, only deliver this to people who actually want it. Like a pub sub kind of service, except at IP level. Transport layer. Ah, this is where we start coming up with reliable versus unreliable delivery. The most commonly used transport protocol is, in fact, TCP. Not the only transport protocol, just the, by far the most common transport protocol. It replaced NC. NC control protocol, the network top of IP, 70s, that was TCP. There are lots of limitations to NC. We engineer it. There was that. Today it's super, super hard. But change TCP. However, while spelunking through, I said, gee, look, there's a brand new RFC 9293 that was issued in August of 2022 that made RFC 793, which was still active until the August one, obsolete. So they actually have written a new RFC. I was like, wow, that is brave. And I suspect that was probably a decade in the making. So it's not like TCP and it's not like it's not evolving. It's there. It is. Hopefully you never actually have to implement your own TCP, although it is kind of fun. I've never implemented it, but I have implemented the transport. That was one of the things I did. RFC 1045. There's also this thing called the user datagram protocol, which is defined in RFC 760. Basically, user datagram protocol is this extraordinarily thin veneer on top of IP. Put a port number in there. That's pretty much it. It does not provide any additional service guarantee. TCP provides reliable delivery and quality of service and uh, Connection state and blah blah blah. So this is where things start to get a little different between the OSI model, which separated connection state from uh, from the transport layer. At session level, this is where I actually keep track of like of an idea of open and close. I open a connection, I close a connection. TCP actually encapsulates a connection state as well. UDP doesn't. Presentation layer is responsible for data packing and unpacking. Uh, let's see. Anybody have a non-Intel based computer? Anybody have a phone? Odds are your phone's probably not. But you all have non-Intel. Uh, that would be ARM. ARM is dominant. Apple's decided to their ARM as well. So. Or not, Windows is. Decade. When I first started working on Windows, available. Oh, and. Alpha. Alpha is. Same year. Have a very long parallel history. Linux and Windows NT, current version of both exist exactly the same. That was California Berkeley about basically out of the unit. No one up to that point. Microsoft was actually the largest largest provider of Unix. They got screwed over and they were like, we're not putting all our eggs in that basket. They went and built an operating system. Similarly, Linux community came about because three versions of Unix that were available at that point allowed it. They weren't sure what was going to happen. They had a lawsuit. The best part is both operating systems are based on papers of 1973 at the Symposium on Operating Systems at the same session. That's how parallel 
five stars. We don't have that parallelism. Session protocols are kind of less, there's not one session protocol. TCP essentially provides you with session. Then we run each top of that, which is stateless. That's why we use cookies. Everybody likes cookies. Everything on top is everything else. Web browsers, FTP, NFS, so on and so forth. So let's define an internet again. Uh, two or more connected networks become connected. Challenges, we have to worry about how do we move packets between them? How do we charge people? And your ISP provides you with some sort of service for a fee. They are charging you. People they connect to are charging them for it. In fact, at some level, what ends up ultimately happening is the inter change across various internet service providers is complicated. Price based pricing. How many of you saw um, cost connection in actually Calgary? How many of you tell it? As far as I know, TELUS is. How many of you? Novus Corp. They give you the best service, lowest latency you have in a decade. And their commercial connection is right here. They give. Security. <laughs> we don't need no security. Who cares? It's the internet. I just had to renew my. And they were asking me about the cybersecurity stuff, and they have this whole thing. And I was like, like talking about, well, are you using uh, offline, offline, or offsite cold storage for your backup? And then their answer, okay, with cloud backup. That actually was their answer. Oh, well, that's fine. But that's not cold, and it's not offline. It's inconvenient. And there were times when I was on that Blu ray burner. Burn things to a Blu ray. Oh, my data is not that. Maybe yours is. But there are people who actually work. When I was uh, at Microsoft Research, the project they told me I was going to work on that I didn't work on, the project stored data in glass. And the reason that they were recording data in glass is because it can last thousands of years. And they were using holographic techniques for recording the data on the glass so that you could even break the glass and still get the data back. Yeah, I know, it's it just this mind-bending stuff. And then uh, about a month ago, six weeks ago, they, I actually saw them do video. I haven't seen announced them, it's on LinkedIn. But they're talking about building robots to go fetch the right pieces of glass. And it gave me a good insight into my own research. For all this data, but it takes longer and longer and longer and longer for us to retrieve it. And remember I was telling you about one of the hard things being data? I can't brute force search something that's going to take me to pull back off of all of the storage. I've got to keep moving all these different pieces of glass in. Brute force search eventually fails you. So how do you find things for six weeks ago, six months ago? How do you find anything? You have to collect lots and lots of metadata up front. Performance is kind of what I'm talking about. Ask you things about. If you're gaming and your latency is uh, 300 milliseconds, you're going to be like, staring at your computer. And I, I, various reasons. I actually have WoW now on an EU, on EU servers. I have friends in the UK. Uh, and there's no cross, can't cross that. It's about 150. It's just barely tolerable. It's much slower. Performance is how long do you take? 
uh, challenges here, heterogeneity, interoperability. So we gain things from heterogeneity, like we gain better security, we gain better um, resilience. But we lose things, which is now that means we actually have to make sure that things work together. Classic thing that I do in um, uh, the OS course. Student sits down, writes a client, writes a server, the client talks to the server. Tries it with our server and it doesn't work. I have a different student. Great, ship me your machine. Problem with almost anything environment that it has to interoperate with other people. Operating with your it's not the same. How do we find resources? Okay, so now we got all these resources distributed around. How do we find them? I don't know. I'll just start scanning ports on random internet locations until I find what I'm looking for? Uh, no, I have to actually be able to translate what I need into how I get to it. That's really all naming is about. How do I get things across that? Routing. What, what route do you think take? Turns out, I can send multiple messages and they don't have to take the same route to get there. Which is going to create different interests. How do I make this reliable? What guarantees do I provide? Guarantees cost money. That's the harsh reality of it. The reason you buy something from AliExpress is because it's dirt cheap, and even if you have to buy it three times, it's still buying it from Amazon. And it's this. So let's talk a little bit about this. We have to deal with addressing routing. Each time we go through a different layer, it is very likely that we are going to have some sort of different addressing model. So when I talk on the data link layer at Ethernet, I've got a MAC address. When I talk on the IP layer, I've got an IP address. So somewhere, somebody's got to be able to translate an IP address to an Ethernet address. And that is probably the other most common protocol on Ethernet. It's called the address resolution protocol, where you literally send a broadcast message going, hey, is anybody named 1921681.47? Just to oh, a hypothetical but valid. IP address. And then somebody else goes, yeah, that's me. Or they don't. Got to deal with performance issues. Can a message be? Okay, so here's a question. Your maximum message size is 1,500 bytes, and you need to send 3K. How are you going to do that? My usual analogy here is, okay, so suppose you actually have a, um, a keg. So there's beer in the keg, and you need to get it into you. How are you going to do that? Or if you don't want to have an analogy. You have a pile of dirt here, and you need that pile of dirt over here. This is more like a military analogy, right? How do you get that pile of dirt from here to here? Well, I suppose one way to do that would be just simply have a really big bucket shovel, pick it all up, move it all across, boom. Well, now this pile of dirt is twice as big. Your, your shovel is no longer big enough. How do you do this? I, this is actually a question I'm actually asking you, because I know it's really simple, but I want to make sure you're awake. How do you do it? Right, you do it a little piece at a time. It's called segmentation and reassembly. So you take it apart, you put it back together. Okay, well, piles of dirt, we generally don't care what the order is. Data, do. So let's suppose you have a house over here and you need to move that house to over here. And you disassemble the house over there and you put it over here. What do you have to do when you get over here? Well, I don't know, how about if we just like randomly cut it into bits and pieces? Put it back over here, right? That's going to work really well. Oh, do is you carefully sort everything out, you number it, you label it, so that when you get over here, you know where everything's supposed to go. It's like moving. Same thing, right? You put all the kitchen stuff goes in this box. You don't just have to randomly go through and pull stuff from different rooms and put them in the boxes because you drive yourself crazy. 
of course, if you've moved, you know that you throw half of the stuff away before you move. You throw half of the stuff away after you move. You end up with less than a quarter of what you started with. Same basic principle here. We have to worry about ordering because if I scramble your data, I told you to move 3K, you move it in two 1K chunks, there's 50 50 shot you're going to get in the right order if you don't have some extra data there to tell you what the ordering was. So, packet size is going to become a big issue there because it's going to force us to do segmentation reassembly. We're going to have data loss issues. We have dissimilar network technology. What happens if your packet size is 1500 and mine is 496? IP actually deals with that. It actually refragments it. But once you fragment it, it's smaller. You don't fragment it back again until you get to the other end. And the delivery order thing is really the, the whole sequence. How do I keep data in? A common mistake I see people make when they first start Socket is they assume that data is going to arrive in the same order and the same at the same size. This is, it does arrive in order, but it doesn't necessarily arrive in the same size that it was sent in. So we're doing protocols, right? So you send, uh, in this case, our, our, our word is get, get file. Uh, it's a get file. And so what do I write a test program that does? It sends get, then it sends file. You have to be able to get two different messages and put them back together and realize that, that, that the fact that it was broken up in this arbitrary way doesn't actually make any difference. This is what protocol development ends up being. This is kind of what guarantees am I provided? What can I assume? Assume packets will show up in the same size they were sent. If you use Unix domain sockets on Linux, that's exactly what you get. Packet sizes, all the boundaries are absolutely preferred. But when you go to a TCP packet, huh, no. And you have no control over that. So you have to deal with that. So naming. IP has two naming spaces. You have a 32 byte and a 32 byte. Sorry, four byte, 32 bit, 120. We ran out of IPv4 addresses many years ago. Actually, it costs quite a lot of money. Why? You can still buy them. You already own them. But it's expensive. There are a few blessed companies that got in early and they got a very large space networks. So at the TCP or UDP layer, we get two bytes called the port. Bytes, 16 bits, that means we have 65,536 options. 0 through 65,535. Uh, in PCERPC, we created UUIDs, bytes as well. We write magic number here. Big number. I think that's enough to give every subatomic particle in the own UUID. Real reason that we wanted to use that is we want to generate these things in a fitted fashion without any. Uh, so then we have to worry about logical to physical naming as well. That's like the IP address to the MAC address on But it happens over and over and over again. Take www.foo.com, we have to map it to uh, FP colon blah blah blah. IP address. Mostly use IPv4 addresses as examples because they're. Got this nice little diagram, it shows you how all this routing works, you know, how all this name resolution stuff works, and DNS is probably one of the oldest there is. And it was today. Sometimes it's. Routing is about how do I move packets across networks? Network service models. As soon as the best, best effort, we packets that are lost, damaged, out of order, uh, we provide enhanced services, quality of service, reliability, yada, yada, yada. 
kind of move along because failure models. We're going to talk about failure over and over and over again. We have models. These are kinds of failures. I've mentioned all of them. Yeah, I know. I actually have one. Uh, things taking too long, and I actually put a link paper in here. Thing that was done at the University of Chicago and a bunch of other institutions talking about slow failures. Slow failures are actually really bad in data centers because they cause tail latency blow ups and they cause service level agreement failures. Byzantine, people lie. Deliberately or accidentally, they lie. We get information from them. How are we going to deal with so it? TCP provides all sorts of guarantees. I'm not going to read that. Not that interesting, but he has disadvantages as well. And so the question is going to become: How do we actually decide if he's lost or not? Talking about some of the functionality, multiplex routing, and addressing and naming. Turns out that if you have two slow connections, you can actually balance across them. You can send packets and both of them. There are techniques for doing this: quick balancing, fault tolerance, bonding. There's lots of different ways. To you're like me, and you actually don't ever want your internet to fail. You have both Telus and Shaw, and you have them connected into the router, and it load balance across them. And then if one of them fails, the other one won't. Don't lose connectivity. Probably don't do that at home, but really do that because you cannot afford the cost of having the internet. Tons and tons of layering. Uh, so again, everything down in the trunk at each layer is why on the lower layer to provide the services it's guaranteed. That's the whole point of those abstractions that we're building. And then we build our own functionality on top of that. It can be UDP. You can basically go, yeah, super thin veneer over IP. That's great. Or you can be TCP goes, no, I give you connections, and I give you reliable delivery, and I give you quality of service, and I give you all these other things. And, and all these things are really great ideas, but um, honestly, uh, these are ideas. The reality is that it's a lot more complicated than actually who it's not this clean. Reality is never this clean. IP, you know, is all stateless except for IP security. It provides security service. It literally provides encryption. It means you have to have key management somewhere in here because that now means you have state. But I thought, wait a minute, I thought it was a datagram protocol. Yeah, it's a datagram protocol until you want security. Then it's a datagram protocol with security. And we see this similar thing. I've pretty much talked about all this IP layering, blah, 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 where things. So again, we can piece things together at different layers, gateways at the physical layer, data link layer, at the network layer. There you do it at the transport layer. Sometimes that actually happens. Move between one protocol and another. You can bridges functionality. This is the entire internet protocol suite. I crib these off of Ivan, who deal about the fact that we have this very narrow waist here. And that's important because it Makes it more more interoperable because we all work on top of one protocol. I don't know. It, at, at the top up here, we have so many different application layers that, that it's clear that interoperability isn't important at every layer. But at the lower layers, we tend to see a lot of homogeneity in terms of protocols because there's not a lot that we can value add there. Whereas at the top, we can we specialize. Each layer encapsulates each previous layer this is the way that messages are actually built. So I build my frame, and then I put your message inside of it. And then you built your frame by putting somebody else's message inside of that. And so we start with a 1500 byte Ethernet packet, and we end up with much smaller amounts of space, 100 bytes or something, added number. Because of all the protocols that get involved there. Uh, UDP has a much smaller header than TCP. He has state information in his header. GP, sorry, 
here it is. It's the port in a sequence element. That's it. So we can have different implementations at different levels. So I can have different TCP stacks. All of our TCP stacks are supposed to interoperate with each other unless it does happen. Interoperability is a huge challenge. It's going to be a huge challenge in distributed systems. You're going to run into it over and over and over. Don't test with other people's implementations. I guarantee you, the odds that it's going to work, an epsilon band around zero as a mathematician. Here's a list of the IP protocols. There's lots and lots of them. A small list of the IP protocols, starting with the lowest numbered one. So. How do we demultiplex protocols? Well, the IP header itself actually has data in it with protocol. Nope. So what I'm going to do now, nine. I am actually going to wrap it up here, and I'll just finish. Okay. Rather than just blowing through them and destroying them, which I can blow through them and destroy them on. Okay, when you're not. We're going to stop here. If you have any questions? Let me know. Otherwise. I will be hanging around on Discord uh, around four o'clock. Feel free not to show up. I'll probably just sit there and you know um, go pick herbs. This is what you do in WoW, right? Is it unless you're raiding, you're going and picking flowers or um, mining ore or those kinds of things. Oh, it's great. Actually, sometimes it's very and you can go fishing. Fishing is actually surprisingly relaxing in in, in World of Warcraft. <laughs> All good. And thanks to the audience at home, that is the end of the stream for today.